Welcome to episode 13 of the DNA Papers podcast series that takes an in-depth view of the seminal publications on the discovery of DNA and how we came to understand its importance in biology through learning about the various aspects of its structure and functions. Today's episode is actually the second installment of a discussion of a set of papers that brought us the famed double helix model for the three-dimensional structure of the DNA molecule. Last time, we discussed the contributions of the experimentalists, and today we talk about the structure that was deduced, putting together the data produced in the former as well as other information from other laboratories. Today's discussion is built around four related papers, all written by Francis Crick and James Watson, within a short window of just a few months. The first one, titled A Structure for Deoxyribose Nucleic Acid, is arguably the most famous and recognized paper in the history of DNA. So much so that for many people, lay audiences mostly, this paper marks the beginning or discovery of DNA. Since we've spent the last year or so showing our audience that that was not the case, that DNA was discovered in the 19th century and had a rich and eventful history prior to 1953, I will not belabor that point here. Rather, I'll simply point out that this paper fully deserves its fame, albeit for reasons that are somewhat different than those that the popular misconceptions have led people to believe. It was published as a bundle of three papers, along with the two discussed in the previous episode, together labeled as molecular structure of nucleic acids. The second paper, titled simply as Structure of DNA, was a talk given by Watson at the 1953 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium. The third paper, which was published five weeks after the first in the same journal, that is Nature, was about genetical implications of the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid. The last paper in the series is titled The Complementary Structure of Deoxyribonucleic Acid, and it was, as Crick described a little over two decades later, a rather detailed technical account of the structure, published a year later in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. Now, although the titles of the papers are mercifully short, in contrast to many papers from previous episodes, there are four of them, and merely listing them has already taken up enough of your time. And instead of chattering on about them, I'll introduce you to our distinguished lineup of guests and let them take over this conversation. First, joining us again from UCLA, where she's both a professor in the history department and at the Institute for Society and Genetics, is Soraya Dichadaravian, who provides us with some continuity from the previous episode. Welcome back, Soraya. I am so glad you could make it again. Thank you, Niaj. Very happy to be here. Also returning to the series is Matthew Cobb from the University of Manchester. He has been both commentator and guest moderator in previous episodes. With an ongoing biographical project on Francis Crick, Matthew's participation in today's episode was a no-brainer, and I'm delighted to welcome him back to the series. Great to be back, Narja, and it feels a bit like we've climbed Mount Doom and we're about to throw the ring into the fiery furnace. We've got there. Super. Next, I'd like to welcome a new guest, another no-brainer, really, for this particular episode, historian of science and medicine, Nathaniel Comfort from Johns Hopkins University. His presence here, like that of Matthew, like I said, was a natural choice because he's writing a biography of James Watson. Prior to becoming a historian, Nathaniel worked in the communications office at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories when Watson was the director. And I'm really interested to learn what that brings to Nathaniel's take on the discussion today. Very happy you could join us, Nathaniel. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here, Narajan. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Last but not least, I'd like to introduce science writer Georgina Ferry, who joins us from Oxford the biographer of famous figures in the early history of molecular biology, including Nobel laureates Dorothy Hodgkin and Max Peretz. Georgina's also written about the double helix, 
and brings a valuable public-facing perspective to the history of the double helix and of DNA and its reception by different audiences more generally. Welcome, Georgina. Thank you for agreeing to participate in today's discussion. I'm happy to be here, Niraja, and looking forward to where this discussion might take us. So my first question is, what are these papers about? And I'll ask each of you or some of you to give a two-sentence summary, one for each of the papers. Soraya, would you go first with the first paper? Yeah, I love to, but I think I need a bit more than just two sentences, maybe, if you allow. You already mentioned in the first of a bundle of three and that were published together in Nature in April 1953. And so the way that these papers relate to each other is actually important, but I think we will may address this question later. So the first one, it's just one page long, and it proposes a new structure for DNA, which is still written with dots, which is quite interesting. And this structure consists of two helical chains, coiled around the same axis and held together by hydrogen bonds between the two bases that point into the inside of the molecule. Now, this structure, which they described, is illustrated by a diagram made by Odile Crick, which is in the paper and has achieved, I think, its own degree of fame. So maybe we want to say a little bit more about that. It has been often reprinted and also we see it on uh, slides. So it has been shown. It's also in the background of the model that Watson and Crick built. So what I think is also important to highlight is that two authors clearly state that the novel feature of the structure is not so much the fact that this is a double helix, although that's the way it's often perceived, but rather that the important thing lies in the pairing mechanism of the basis. And this entails that if the sequence of one chain is known, the sequence of the other chain is automatically determined. And this then also leads to the famous final sentence, it has not escaped our knowledge, that this pairing mechanism immediately suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. As a matter of fact, they have already sort of described it briefly in that first paper. And then what's also interesting is what they say about the production of this, how they come up with this structure. And so they say it is mainly, though not entirely, based on published experimental data and stereochemical arguments. The stereochemical arguments, of course, those also put into the modeling that they did, and that it has to be regarded as unproven until it has been checked against more exact crystallographic data. And of course, the paper has become at least as famous or perhaps notorious for what it does not mention. And that is a clear acknowledgement of the use of Franklin's unpublished data, especially the information of the space group that gave Crick the hint that the two chains run anti-parallel. But I'm sure we'll also get to this point later. Nathaniel, would you introduce the next paper, please? Sure, I, I will try to be concise and leave most of it for the discussion. When Watson and Crick solved the double helix, as it happened, Max Delbrook was organizing the annual symposium at Cold Spring Harbor for that summer, held on June 5th through 11th, 1953. Delbrook was probably the biggest influence on Watson in his early career. So when Watson told Delbrook about the double helix, Delbrook opened a crack in an already packed conference schedule and gave Watson, I think it was eight minutes to talk about the structure. And with the help of Linus Pauling, a physical chemist at Caltech, he obtained emergency funding from the Rockefeller Foundation to fly Watson from London and back. And he also distributed a reprints of the, the three papers bundled, as you described, to all of the participants. He made Watson the star of the meeting. And Crick did not go to the meeting. It was Watson was there by himself. He wrote the paper in April and May and brought with him a small perspex model of the double helix, which one can find. He delivered the talk in a shiny new lecture hall now known as Bush Auditorium. And he did so in his trademark you know, outfit of an untucked shirt, shorts, and sneakers with no shoelaces. 
And it's a very brief paper. There's not a whole lot of new information in it compared to some of the others, but there are a couple of interesting things about it that we can discuss. Thank you. Matthew, would you go next? The second Nature paper, which, as you say, appears five, six weeks after the first, is a paper that Watson didn't want to write, or he didn't want to have published. Crick was very keen on it because it's entitled The Genetical Implications of the Structure of DNA. And it does precisely that. It speculates about what might be the consequences of this structure that they have put forward. And Watson at this time, we know from both his own accounts at the time, but also from Crick's recollections in the 60s, was absolutely terrified that they got it wrong, that the structure would turn out to be incorrect and that he would look a fool. And as a young man who had to think about his future, <laughs> I think that's mainly what he was thinking about, he wanted to make sure that he was not going to look a fool. So the more attention that was drawn to the structure, the less comfortable he was. They had an argument, him and Crick, over whether they should publish or not. And in the end, as he put it to Delbrook, to keep the peace, he decided to let it go. So the article is very speculative. It's about twice as long as the, the first paper. I mean, it's just a set of ideas. You'd never get it published these days. You could write in a blog about it, which is pretty much the kind of thing it is. And it includes the structure again and a series of images of the nucleotides. But above all, it was fast-tracked. And it's the other thing to remember. It appeared within three weeks, which even for the time was extraordinarily quick. And it was again signed Watson and Crick, although Crick wrote it and Watson didn't want to publish it because they apparently tossed a coin and Crick lost. And I think the key thing in it, what I think is probably the most significant part of all this, is not just that the DNA molecule can replicate and they discussed some of the ways that that might take place, but above all, it tells you how mutations could occur. If you alter one base, that would alter the structure of the gene. And it led Crick to put forward this half sentence, which is quite extraordinary. He says that it therefore seems likely that the precise sequence of the bases is the code which carries the genetical information. And something like that is said in university lecture theatres and high school classrooms all over the world every day, but nobody had ever put those ideas of sequence, code and information together before in one idea. So that's that paper, which I think was tremendously influential. And we know from comments by people like Francois Jacob, he didn't even look at the first paper because he didn't understand it. This he could understand because it's just full of ideas. The second paper, which was published in 1954 and is authored Crick and Watson, that was still written in the summer. Uh, unlike Nature publishing in three weeks, this took seven months to publish. They submitted it in, or Bragg rather, submitted it in uh, August 1953, just before both Watson and Crick went to the US, Crick for his postdoc and Watson to go back to his future. And this is, as you outlined, it's a very detailed description of the model with all the details which they could not put into the first document. And above all, if you read it very carefully, aside from all the business about angles and all the rest of it, some of which wasn't quite right, which Morris Wilkins went on to demonstrate, above all, it does clearly state repeatedly in the text, which was mainly written by Watson, that they used a unpublished information from the King's group, in particular from Franklin. They thank her repeatedly. They explain everything. They try to fit all the subsequently published data from the King's group into their results, with the exception of one fact, which we can discuss later on, and that is the space group, the C2 symmetry, which Sarai referred to earlier on. That is not mentioned. And I think it's not a matter of covering it up. It's because Watson wrote the article. And as Crick always said, he never understood that argument. Nathaniel. One of the most striking things about the Cold Spring Harbor paper is that it gives ample credit to Wilkins and Franklin. Wilkins is mentioned in the paper 11 times and Franklin's name is mentioned seven times in, the, in this short paper. Okay. Actually, I have a follow-up question to that, which is, wasn't Wilkins invited to be a co-author for the first paper? Yes, he was. He was. To their great relief, he declined. 
Watson also invited Wilkins to put his name on the Cold Spring Harbor paper, and again he declined. Georgina, would you step in next? And now that each of the four papers has been talked about, kind of what it all means in a few short sentences before we move on. Well, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention. One thing that we haven't really picked up because there's been so much focus on the structure itself is that the original paper, the first paper, is very, very short, but it spends most of its first main paragraph rubbishing a previous attempt at a structure by Linus Pauling. And I'm kind of quietly amused by that because Pauling obviously was this tremendous figure in chemistry, the, the father of the chemical bond and the fact that these two upstarts can step in and say he made absolutely every mistake going in trying to put together his structure and just getting that out of the way before they go on to talk about their own. I think that's quite fun in a way. But the other thing that really strikes me, I mean, the others have, have picked it up, but the thing that strikes me most strongly is the way the acknowledgement of the King's experiments evolved from the first paper, which says, as people probably know, we have also been stimulated by a knowledge of the general nature of the unpublished experimental results and ideas of Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Franklin and their co-workers at King's. And then in the Royal Society paper, which I have to confess, before being invited to participate in this podcast, I hadn't read. And it's immensely detailed. There's just so much more going on in that paper. But it has a long footnote in which it says the information reported in this section was very kindly reported to us prior to its publication by Drs. Wilkins and Franklin, and goes on to say how heavily indebted they are to the King's group, and actually says, we wish to point out that without this data, the formulation of our structure would have been most unlikely. Whereas the first paper almost gives the impression that it was, oh, it was quite nice to look at it, but actually, you know, we'd done all the work already. And this goes much further towards saying that without this experimental data, we would have been left in doubt. We would not have been as confident as we are with the structure. And for me personally, it's made me change my mind about something because an impression I think I've been left with by Brenda Maddox's biography of Rosalind Franklin, which I think is excellent, was that she never knew when she died in 1958 that Watson and Crick had seen particularly her photograph. But that acknowledgement and I'm sure she must have read that paper, makes it pretty clear, and uh, as well as the text of the article, that they had seen all that material, including the photographs of both the A and the B form, and that they relied on them for the structure. So she must have known, and I have to retract the one remaining criticism I had of Watson and Crick, that they'd never told her how important her data was to them. Well, Nathaniel and Matthew recently published a paper, recently, yes, still very recent compared to all the papers we're discussing, in which they talk about this issue at some length. Would you like to bring that up now? And Soraya, you have something to say. Maybe I can say this one thing, because it was really not the photograph that was decisive. It was the knowledge of the C2 group. And the C2 group was not automatically in the photograph. It was in, in the report. This was an internal, MRC internal report. And, you know, there's a story about it, how they saw it and if it was proper or not proper to see it. But that's where Crick got the information from. And Watson couldn't make any sense out of it, as Nathaniel already mentioned. So the whole focus on the photo is a little bit misleading. Yes, I, I agree. It's just that they do also talk about the reflection that was in. In, in the article, they talk about the reflection. Yeah, I completely take your point about the space group information being critical. But I think the mythology about Franklin and the B-51 photograph is that it was stolen, that she didn't know they had it. And this paper, it seems to me, makes it clear that she did know they had it. And that was all I was suggesting. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Georgina, and your confession that you haven't, hadn't read the paper before is admirably honest, and I think that shows that, in fact, many people who've commented on this have not actually read that paper, because when you do read it, it is absolutely clear that Franklin knew, because she would have read the paper, she knew exactly what happened. I think there is an extra layer of complexity in this story, which is, again, revealed in that paper about how exactly they went about building the model in those kind of six weeks in late January and February. And although Sarai is right that the C2 symmetry, which tells you that if there's an even number of strands, they must be going in opposite directions, 
although that was significant to Crick, it was never significant to Watson. He didn't understand the argument and they didn't use it in the model building. All of Crick's long discussions with Olby, which he did in the middle of the 60s, so before the double helix came out, in which he was recollecting what happened. It was significant to him because he had a, this bee in his bonnet, but they tried everything. They call it in their Royal Society article, they call it, that was their method, trial and error. I mean, we always call it model building, which sounds fancy. But in fact, they were fiddling around with bits of cardboard, trying to make it fit with the stereochemical arguments. And they were starting as much from chemistry as anything else. The one thing they were absolutely certain about was the 34 angstrom repeat of the height of the molecule. But that had been discovered in the 1930s. So they hadn't got that from anybody. There's no one piece of information that they were absolutely depending on. And in their model building, they, they're fiddling about, they absolutely threw everything out to try and see whether they could make it fit the known chemical composition and stereochemistry. I think that's right, Nathaniel? Yes, well said, Matthew. I would, just to give the flip side of that story. So the photograph 51, as far as we can tell, and, and as far as Matthew has found in all of his digging, photograph 51 made no impression on Crick, and he probably didn't see it until after they'd built the model. Photograph 51 is famous because Watson put it in the double helix and made it the dramatic climax of this very much novelized story, right? And the photograph did have an impact on Watson. When he saw it, he kind of realized, oh my gosh, it's really a helix. But that's really all it told him. It gave him motivation to go and you know ask for permission to go back and work on DNA with Crick and build the models, order new parts from the machine shop, and so forth. It kicked Watson into action, but it absolutely did not, could not have given him the double helix, and it apparently made no impact on Crick. These papers, especially the first 1950 three paper, double helix paper, is arguably the most famous paper about DNA, not just among scientists and historians, but also, I think, for the lay public. But despite a general impression that exists now that these papers provided a light bulb moment in the history of DNA, the reality is that the road to fame was a lot rockier. Could you all talk a little bit about this history of the reception of these papers, both immediately and then how the perception of these papers has changed over time. I think there are two aspects to it. There's the public perception and there's the scientific reception. The public perception was, in fact, a lot greater than has often been suggested in that it was not only picked up eventually, it took a, took a month or so, but eventually it was picked up by newspapers all over the world, by the local press in the UK, by the, the South China Post. It did become a big thing. It was called the Mount Everest of biochemistry. As this is one of the Crick's buzz lines that he was giving to journalists when he was, and to the public, when he was presenting the model in, in the Cavendish. So people became very rapidly aware that something quite extraordinary had been discovered, but the implications of it weren't very clear. And the scientific community, I think really what happened was that many people who were uncertain about the significance of the various experiments of, that had been done, Hershey and Chase, but above all, the work that had been done in the 40s, they now suggested that DNA was the genetic material. The structure now really said, well, it's very, very likely to be because it looks right. And that is, I think, the most striking thing is that had DNA been, say, the structure of hemoglobin, which is all blobby and incomprehensible, then it wouldn't have had the same impact because it can be explained and it's immediately obvious what's going on. Then people could then begin to change their minds or become open to the possibility that DNA alone and not DNA plus proteins or just proteins were the genetic material. But it was still a working hypothesis for the next decade. It was a decade before I think everybody finally accepted that the genetic material was DNA and there's no more argument about it because there wasn't actually any proof. I think that, that's, the, that's the key point you have to remember. Georgina? Well, I mean, I think by the conclusion of that following decade, the code had been cracked. And that was, I suppose, the whole idea of there being a code that encodes everything about every living being on the planet was, if you like, a, 
an almost romantic idea. And it goes back to what Matthew said earlier about information, about how this remarkable piece of sloshy biology actually encodes some hard data, which specifies in some way or another how we all turn out in our lives. Obviously, there's much more to it than that. And it's not deterministic in the way I just suggested it. But that the idea of, of a code, which wasn't explicitly stated early on, it was the, you know, the whole it has not escaped our notice bit. It was all rather uncertain. But by the end of that decade, the code had come out. And of course, the other thing was that they won the Nobel Prize. And um, that was you know, nine years after the discovery, they won the Nobel Prize, which does, you know, a bit to raise your profile. And I think one of my roles here might be to give a little shout out for proteins, because, of course, by that time, the structures of myoglobin and hemoglobin had also been solved. And actually, hemoglobin did get a fair bit of publicity. Everybody knows what blood is. <laughs> the idea that you can actually understand at the level of the molecule how it carries oxygen around the body and what, why we need it. We can't just have dissolved oxygen in water. You need to have this molecule that's going to act a, as a little machine to pick up and and drop oxygen. So I think structural biology was achieving results that did make it through to the public consciousness, and DNA was part of that. Suraya? I mean, the whole idea of analyzing structures was to understand function. Now, the DNA was an extremely nice and probably the only case where the structure really suggested this replication mechanism. And Watson and Crick have it in their first paper. But to be the genetic material, it also needed to be able to understand how you get from the DNA to the protein. I think that was already thought of in these terms. And, and that, the structure did not give away at all, even if it stimulated a lot of thinking about what could happen, right? And then, of course, with the codes, which was not solved through stereochemical argumentation and not through cryptoanalytical thinking, but actually through straightforward biochemistry, that then was an important step forward. So that's the one thing. And then I think Crick has explained it quite well. So he said, you know, at the time there was a band, a small band of people that were interested in these problems and for whom that was really exciting. But it was a small band of scientists. It wasn't a big thing. I mean, you know, this happened in the Cavendish in Cambridge. And I mean, I have testimonies of people who are just working above or below or at, at the site and they take no notice of this wonderful model which was built up there. They, they just didn't even know about it, right? So that explains it was interesting to a little group of people and they were excited about it. And it certainly didn't have this big cultural iconic importance that it gained later and that was really a step-by-step -step process but really much stimulated i don't think so much even to the nobel prizes because you know there are many nobel prizes and most people wouldn't even know to remember who got the nobel prize this year and last but so really watson's book here i think really made the decisive impact. And I'm sure we will say more about Watson's book that I think really explains a lot why DNA became what it became. And I think another thing which is maybe not mentioned so often is the debate about the origin of molecular biology. Because so molecular biology, which was not just DNA, which was all the protein work and, you know, work on membranes and on the nerves, how muscles work and so on and so on. And so there were these debates about what molecular was and non was, and there was all kinds of origin stories debated. And there was some kind of a compromise between these two different schools, the informational school, which is the one which dominated the Delbrück group, out of which Watson came, and the structural group, out of which Crick came. And so then there was this compromise. I mean, this account has been much criticized and so on and so on, but still I see it's still around. And so the double helix represented the combination of these two schools in a way. And so that's also one of the points where the double helix starts becoming sort of this origin of this new science. I mean, which historians have attacked right and left, but that's also how A moves in the center of these kinds of, of accounts. Actually, to that point, there's a passage in the Cold Spring Harbor paper. One of the things that we've already talked about as one of the key points of significance in the double helix is the complementarity of the base pairs, right? And there's an interesting 
idea here in Watson's paper about complementarity. And Delbrook and Linus Pauling had years before, 1940, discussed this idea of complementarity in biology. And Watson writes in the Cold Spring Harbor paper, it has generally been suggested that protein and nucleic acid are complementary to each other, and that self-replication involves the alternate syntheses of these two components. We should like to propose instead that the specificity of DNA self-replication is accomplished without recourse to specific protein synthesis. So it's the complementarity between the two chains of the double helix rather than complementarity of protein to DNA. So what that would mean would be the protein somehow bound to the DNA in order to replicate. And one of the innovations here is taking that old idea that a lot of people had been sort of using as part of their theoretical framework and shifting all of that weight onto the base pairing of the double helix. So once again, going back to this issue of mystique, because we've been talking about the mystique of the double helix, which is certainly enhanced, I think, by, as Soraya pointed out, Watson's double helix book in the 60s. But I had another question, and maybe Matthew would be the first person to take this up because you've also written about Avery. Why are these papers, for example, better known or better publicized? And it's not just personality, is it? With Avery et al.'s 1944 paper, and there were some other interesting parallels that I thought might be worth mentioning in that both Avery, the year before he published their paper, and Crick, months before the paper was published, wrote these letters to people who were, well, Avery wrote it to his brother, who was another microbiologist, but Crick wrote it to his son, explaining what it's about. And the reception of these letters is also quite different, not just because I think it was written to a son, but also because of who wrote them, right? Avery's paper went to his brother and went to the Vanderbilt University archives and can be seen by anybody who goes to that university. Crick's letter to his son got sold off for a tremendous price at the auction. And then, of course, the money was distributed to various Crick archives. Matthew. It's a bit going back to the Avery discussion we had. Why isn't Avery better known? When I gave my lecture this year on the double helix, I asked, there were about 60 students, first year students. I said, well, who's heard of Oswald Avery? And one person put their hand up. On the other hand, only about eight people put their hand up when I said, who's heard of Rosalind Franklin? So there's a lot of work to do, I think, in all respects. I'm not sure why Avery's paper doesn't really get the oomph it, it should do. And he didn't get the respect and renown from the molecular geneticists in particular. But I think it's partly the polar opposite of the Watson and Crick paper, which even if most of it is pretty dull stuff, it does have, as Georgina said, that beginning, which is really quite zippy, and then the end, which is also nice and elegant and, you know, is putting down a marker for, hey, we figured this out. We understand the implications of this in terms of replication. I mean, it's also a bit shorter because Avery's paper does go on a bit. So I think those are the kind of rather pathetic, hand-wavy explanations that I think I've got. In terms of the two letters, they're very different again because Crick, I think it's quite extraordinary the letter he wrote to Michael because one of the things he was always very good at was explaining things in very simple terms. And this was partly, I think, from his childhood dependence on something called the Children's Encyclopedia, which was an Edwardian encyclopedia full of short articles about everything under the sun, but including science, which he adored. He said it was the most important book he ever read. And having read through many of the articles in there about science, they are remarkably clear and you know pitch perfect for a kind of preteen. And Crick obviously somehow kind of absorbed that ability and it was one thing he could do he couldn't write long he never wrote a decent book all his books were short and they were a bit crap they didn't have the pizzazz of the double helix but that letter to michael which he wrote on the 19th of march so about two and a bit weeks from after they'd finished the modeling he describes it all Jim Watson and I have probably made a most important discovery. We have built a mix, a model of the structure for desoxyribose nucleic acid. Read it carefully, called DNA for short. And then he goes on to describe it. And he talks about its function as well. He says it's like it contains a code. 
which excited Michael enormously because he was into codes and he tried to work out what it might be and all the rest of it. In terms of what happened to the letter, it's quite extraordinary that the letter kind of disappeared into Crick's archives. He got it back. Michael obviously gave it back to him. And in the 60s, Olby had it for a while. I mean, this object, which ended up being absolutely incredibly valuable, it got lost. And then eventually there was a photocopy floating about and eventually Crick was able to get it back off Olby. And it was then went to Michael after Crick's death. And he, as you say, he auctioned it for over $5 million, most of which went to the Salk in La Jolla and to the newly established Crick Institute in London. And although you can't actually see it. I don't know who bought it. Simply with more money than sense, I think. You can see photocopies, you know, scans of it are absolutely all over the internet. So in a way, I guess that was Michael's thought that everybody can see this. It's not, you know, they don't own the rights to the actual document, to the reproduction of it. It's just the actual original that some fetishist has spent a lot of money on. Nathaniel? Uh, Thanks. I would add a third letter to this list, which is the one that Watson wrote to Max Delbrook on March 12th, a week before Crick wrote the letter to Michael. And Watson was clearly writing for posterity here. He's He wrote letters to Delbrook every few weeks, but this one has this begins with this formality. Our model, a joint project of Francis Crick and myself, bears no relationship to either the original meaning their original failed triple helix from 1951, or the revised Pauling Corey Shoemaker models. It is a strange model and embodies several unusual features and goes on and on for two and a half more pages. Clearly, Watson is writing this for Delbert to show to other people as a historical document. Although, doesn't he say, please don't show this to Pauling, and doesn't Delbert send it straight off to Oh, he does absolutely say, don't show it to Pauling yet, right? It puts in a postscript, oh, by the way, please don't show it to Linus Pauling. We will let him know as soon as we're confident about the model. And yes, Delbrook, with his characteristic nonchalance, said, oh, I decided to ignore your postscript (laughs) and I went to show it to Pauling immediately because I knew he'd be interested and I wanted to talk about it. And besides, I hate secrecy in science. Do you not think this was an element of Jim being Br'er Rabbit and say, please don't throw me into the briar patch? Could well be. That's speculative, but yeah, it's not unlikely. Soraya? It's interesting, right? Delbrook actually had big doubts about this whole model, and especially, you know, he became very worried about this unwinding problem. And, you know, it was interesting reading again to these papers, as it always is, right? You pick up different things. And I must say, the description in the second paper, the genetic implication, there, Crick and Watson speak quite at length about this winding, unwind. they assume it must be unwinded, and they don't quite know how it goes, and they have quite primitive ideas about how it could work. I mean, biochemistry plays a very minor role, but they think the whole molecule needs to unwind and so on and so on. Anyway, that book became really, really worried about this unwinding problem to the extent that he didn't believe the helix was right, right? And also Watson himself became very worried about this. And I think in the late 50s even still suggested that the two helices were not wind together, but sort of moved one into the other so that they could move away from each other more easily. And so, you know, this letter that he wrote to Delbrück was actually not a triumph, right? But created a lot of doubt in Delbrück's head about the validity. I don't know if he wrote back, I haven't looked at the letter exchange between Delbrück and Watson, but I guess they discussed this, right? Well, these doubts notwithstanding, he did get excited enough to push it and call Linus Pauling and get him invited to the symposium. And it's interesting, Soraya, probably a third of the Cold Spring Harvest Symposium paper addresses that. He's talking to the phage group and he's talking to Max Delbrook, the organizer of the meeting, right? And I realized that a large part of this paper was specifically about the coiling and uncoiling. And he goes into the different forms and Delbrook uses the terms plectonemic and paranemic coiling, which is you know basically what you just described. Do they sort of slide one into the other or are they wrapped around one each other? So it's interesting. I'm sure that he was deliberately addressing Delbrook's concerns in the Cold Spring Harbor paper. I think it's worth just remembering again that it's not only the 
the function that cause doubts how do people do it but it's still the evidence that is still lacking which Wilkins is partly providing but as late as 1970 Nature is publishing articles by Barry Commoner and others saying DNA is not a double helix it's not even a helix it's two straight lines it cannot be and people would write to Crick with these complicated arguments that this was you know biophysically impossible and the, the structure of DNA is only finally proved in the mid 1970s at the same time actually as it was demonstrated that it was the genetic material in eukaryotes when i was an undergraduate this was still an open question whether the genetic material was dna in anything other than viruses and bacteria which is the only place it had been demonstrated Surya, just a very brief follow-up i mean this really does also again confirm that the double helix created more problems than solution the double helix is double helix but it was the complementary mechanism and, you know, in the sequence of the basis and the code and so on that really moved things forward, not the double helix as helix, right? That this created more problems than solutions. And it's so interesting that, you know, the way this was received is just the opposite, right? Probably because it's just too nitty gritty and too, you know, chemical, biochemical and stereochemical and I don't know what evidence and arguments while the double helix, you know, and you were asking, Niraja, why for the mystique? I mean, and people have written about this, right? It's then mixed up with the spiral, and the spiral is this iconic, you know, cultural, there are many references to the spiral, all the origin of life and what defines life and so on and so on. It gets all mixed up, all these metaphysical meanings. And that's also, I think, what explains partly this strong cultural meaning of the double helix much more than complementarity and basis and dubbing because you need some chemistry to appreciate that. It's interesting having this conversation because it's making me look at these papers differently, just even as we talk. In the Cold Spring Harbor paper, as I said, Watson spends a lot of time talking about the coiling problem, and he addresses the possibility that commoner raised later and shows why it would be impossible. You would never be able to get the crystallographic data that they do, it's just not compatible. So he talks about three types of ways that it might be addressed, but he ends with a, a speculation that actually is quite prescient. He says, the untwisting process would be less complicated if replication started at the ends as soon as the chains began to separate. This mechanism would produce a new two-strand structure without requiring at any time a free single-strand stage. And, you know, we have to be careful about retrospective analysis, but that sounds quite a lot like the way that a polymerase works, right, with the leading strand and so forth. So just interesting. Georgina and then Matthew, please. So I'm jumping one back to what Soraya was saying about the shape of the molecule. And I think, you know, going back to what you were saying about Avery's discovery and this one, I think my role here is to say terribly obvious things, but it's so easy to visualize. And we haven't used the word iconic yet, but that's how it's been presented culturally as an icon, which gets used in interminably in all kinds of inappropriate contexts simply because it's such a satisfying shape and such a visually appealing shape. And I don't think one should discount the importance of that in its penetration of the public consciousness, including for people who probably have absolutely no idea why that shape is important. That was what I was stumbling towards earlier on, Georgina, when I was talking about the obvious link. You know, once you see it, it can only be that way. And had DNA not had that structure, then its influence would have been much different, much slower, and wouldn't certainly not have penetrated the public mind. Because with all due respect to hemoglobin, it's very difficult to explain to a 12-year-old the, the link between structure and function in any detail. Whereas with the DNA molecule, as Crick demonstrated, you, you could do. So iconic is this, let's use the word again, that for reasons that escape me, I've, I've got involved in a rather bizarre project, which is going to put Adil Crick's drawing or rather digital version of this on a computer chip as part of a DNA art project which will be on the outside of a, a lander which is going to land on the moon next year 
assuming it doesn't crash. So this was one of the, the symbols that the, the artist is mainly a set of computer art that is being put on this chip. But they also wanted Adele Crick, who was an artist, very skilled artist. They also wanted her original drawing. The other thing I wanted to emphasize in terms of the mystique of DNA is quite how it wasn't DNA at the time. And you can see that my students have been amused by this. If you look at the titles of the three articles, so Watson and Crick is deoxyribose nucleic acid. And then Wilkins paper is deoxypentose nucleic acids. And then Franklin and Gosling's paper is sodium thymonucleate. So DNA just it, not only was it not DNA in, in the figurative form, I didn't yet have the weight and the impact. It literally was not DNA. They couldn't agree. The chemists were still arguing about what term to use for it. And it was becoming, if you excuse the metaphor, crystallized as a consequence, I think, of this paper. Well, I'm going to use your point. You brought up all three authors and their papers that appeared in sequence, each with a different name for the same molecule. And that brings me back to something actually, that was begun in the last episode, which is the interrelationship between these papers. What was written first, what was used when, and it's not quite linearly straightforward, as Soraya pointed out. And so, Soraya, I'd like you to sort of provide the bridge from the last conversation and get this conversation about the relationship between the three original 1953 papers going and then picking up from there to the later Watson and Quick papers. Just to recap here, we discussed first the paper two and three of the original bundle. And that was an interesting exercise because the focus is normally on the first paper and the two and three are maybe mentioned, but not looked at into detail. So that was interesting. But as a matter of fact, the publication history was a bit different, right? So Watson and Crick, once they got the structure and were sort of convinced that it showed something interesting, wanted to publish quite fast. And as has already been mentioned, they asked a Wilkins, and only Wilkins, to be a co-author, and he declined, something that he, by the way, regretted later on, as he writes in his autobiography. But anyway, at the time, he felt that the King's Group should publish independently. And so that's what he set out to do with two of his collaborators, Stokes and Wilson. And he was apparently then a bit surprised and when also Franklin wanted to publish an independent paper. So Franklin apparently had already drafted a paper before they knew about the model. And so she redrafted it to fit into this bundle. So at this point, the King's College group had seen the model. They also received a copy of the Watson Creek draft paper. And so it really what was actually independent work it was it looked a little bit like a confirmation of the model. And at least say it wasn't complete confirmation, but it at least was not in contradiction to the Watson Crick model. But they did also, I think both of them insist on what was original, what they already had found out. In Wilkins' case, it was the double helix that this with uh, two strands. And also that the confirmation of the DNA was the same in vivo. And with uh, Franklin, it was the A and B form and also evidence that A and B were helical. And I think these were the main points. So we did this independently before, but also this is not in confirmation with Watson and Crick's paper. Now, it seems like we can't really know what happened in the background, but because the archives don't exist anymore, the Nature Archive, the Macmillan archives don't exist anymore. But we have to assume that Bragg played an important role in doing this negotiation for waiting for the papers. You know, they had only two weeks, I think. They wanted to be fast because they were worried that maybe Pauling would come up with something else or, you know, or one of the other groups that were working there and to get this out of the door and be published in that way. I think one of the aspects of this story which has become clearer to me is Wilkins is presented in both the Double Helix and in Crick's memoirs and in his own The Third Man DNA as kind of rather sorrowful and but accepting with a, a stiff upper lip, maybe trembling a little bit, that he's been scooped. 
except we know that's not the case. Wilkins was somewhat two-faced, understandably perhaps. On the 19th of March, he wrote to his friend Leonard Hamilton, who was a British chemist working in the USA, and had been, had been sending him the DNA samples that he'd been using, saying, it's an absolute rat race. Francis is being by no means ethical about it all, using all the data and ideas he and Jim got from here, and then maintaining he's done it all by pure reason. But keep that to yourself. I'm very fond of Francis, but he's rather bad on these things. This may sound very mean and anti-scientific, but people just aren't playing the game in this business. Pauling pinches ideas and Francis pinches data and doesn't acknowledge. And later on, he wrote another similar raging letter at Crick's presentation of the double helix saying that he was infected with DNA mania and that you should really take this whole business with a pinch of salt. So even, even Wilkins was wondering whether it was all real. He was simply overwhelmed and annoyed, absolutely livid at his friend's behaviour. Georgina. I always remember the quote from a letter from Wilkins. I can't remember whether it's to Watson or Crick or both of them, where he says, you're a couple of old rogues, which sounds like something you might say to a mate, but it sounds as if he was suppressing a lot more anger. But I actually, I've got a question because I don't know the answer to this. I haven't done the all the archival research that you have done. But where did Randall stand on all this? And was there correspondence between Randall and Bragg? Because Randall must have been, well, pissed off, not to put it mildly. Yeah, he was furious. He was very, very angry. There's nothing in either the Bragg or the Randall archives. The Bragg archives are at the Royal Institution and the Randall archives are at Churchill College. There's no evidence of correspondence between them, but you're absolutely right. They must have written to each other because negotiating between the two MRC units was one of the key problems that Watson and Crick had stumbled into in 1951 when they made their first complete cack-handed attempt at uh, solving the structure. So I don't know the answer to that. And uh, as Sarai says, because the nature archives have all gone, we've got no evidence for how this was kind of worked out. We do know that they're about I can't remember, Nathaniel, how many versions of the manuscript are there of the first Watson Crick paper? Seven or something like that we can see with different I versions. Think we decided it was seven. Yeah, that you can see, and and they're all slightly different as they're trying to get the acknowledgements right, and they're trying with Wilkins. They didn't say anything to Franklin. They're merely negotiating with Wilkins. But that was all partly because they didn't know Franklin. At this one point, we, we should just remember is that they didn't actually, I mean, Watson had met her a couple of times, Crick had met her a couple of times, and that was it. She was not in their circle. And their view of Franklin, which we see in the double helix, was very much that of Wilkins who in another letter later on in the 50s, I'm afraid in 1957, so the year before she died, described, I'm afraid, Franklin as a silly bitch who sabotaged the DNA work. I think there's a lot of undercurrent in Morris Wilkins' attitudes to people. He may have presented in one way, but other than underneath, he was a real raging, seething bag of irritation. I might tag on to that, Matthew, and also to Georgina's point, a couple of circumstantial things that give us maybe a couple of clues. One is that Randall went to the United States and gave a lecture at MIT all about the double helix. And he was, as you might expect, foregrounding Wilkins and Franklin's work and saying, oh, yeah. And then, you know, some of the theory stuff was done by these guys uh, at Cambridge. Secondly, in the 60s, Randall and Bragg did correspond quite a lot over Watson's plan for publication of what became the double helix. And in those letters, they do refer to some of the conversations that they had had back in 53. They don't give, a, you know, quotations and stuff, but they make clear that they had talked about it. Surya? Yeah, I think we know much less about Randall, and I do think he plays an important role, of course, in the whole way the collaboration or non-collaboration between Wilkins and Franklin was set up. But Bragg, I think, also is interesting to consider more in detail because Bragg, I think, had every interest in smoothing any tensions that might be between the two groups, between the King's College. And I think everything he does points in that direction. Because he is someone who also talks about this, he speaks about this in London, and it's picked up by some journalists in the UK and the US. And so I think Bragg had his own reasons to, and I'm sure he spoke also to uh, Crick, with whom he had a tense relationship, and Watson, and so on. 
and then also Rosa and Franklin was already on the way out. I now forget when exactly she left King's College to go to Birkbeck. Does someone know which month it was? It was March, I think. So even before the papers came out, which is not an excuse not to, to talk and include her in the conversations, right? But she, but it also meant, I think, before she left, she surrendered the DNA work, or she was expected to. She actually, as a matter of fact, didn't do it, right? And she wrote a later paper also with Goslin on the data. I think we discussed this in the previous podcast. Quick shameless plug. I'm going to give a... a fair amount of treatment to Bragg and his publicity efforts and so forth, both of the double helix initially and his campaigning for the Nobel Prize. So that's going to be in there. Can't wait for that one. Your book, I mean, just a few minutes. I wanted to bring our conversation back to something that really interested me because it also harks back to something that came up in the third episode, the first one Matthew participated in actually, of the series, which was about Walter Sutton and his two papers. And in it, he ends his first paper in a way with this cliffhanger that sort of, as one speaker, Durga Das pointed out, on the 50th anniversary of that paper virtually, that it's picked up by the double helix paper and the the double helix paper, the famous last statement that was mentioned earlier, it has not escaped our notice statement, speaking of implications. And Sutton did almost the exact same thing. I won't go in and read it right now because we're going to be running short of time. But Matthew, could you comment on that? And also, we talked about it during that episode. Matthew, you mentioned that Crick had not likely read Sutton's paper. And we wondered about Watson, and he said he was going to have to ask you, Nathaniel, and it's only today. So, Nathaniel, Matthew, could you lend your insights into that? And then if Soraya and Georgina have anything, jump in as well. Well, I think it is worth reading that final paragraph because it is actually quite striking. As Sutton says in 1902, I may finally call attention to the probability that the association of paternal and maternal chromosomes in pairs and their subsequent separation during the reducing division, as indicated above, may constitute the physical basis of the Mendelian law of heredity. Now, that's somewhat wordier than Crick snappy. It has not escaped our notice that. I have found no evidence that Crick had ever heard of Sutton. He wrote the sentence. He wrote the first draft, that's in his archives in San Diego, and he always said that he wrote that sentence. So is this some kind of osmosis? Or maybe Jim had been, because Jim liked to imagine nice phrases. He says this, he was always coming up, having read how Pauling wrote, he wanted to imitate that very sharp, snappy, summary way of writing. And he kind of trained himself in his head. So maybe they were chatting about it in the Eagle. And if Jim read Sutton, he kind of, you know, was riffing on it. And that's where it came from. I don't know. Nathaniel, tell us whether Jim read Sutton. Jim read Sutton. One of the real joys of this project has been working with really closely with Matthew at various stages, going to archives together, bouncing stuff back and forth. And so Matthew, one example of that is Matthew wrote to me, asking, you know, any idea whether Jim had ever read Sutton? And so I went back to his graduate school lecture notes from the fall of 1947, where he took, in his first semester of graduate school, he took a survey of genetics from H.J. Muller himself. And Muller taught from primary sources almost exclusively. And There's a page in Watson's lecture notes where he has a number of notes on Sutton. It was on the syllabus and Watson took notes on the paper. So we can't say, of course, how much of it he remembered by 1953, but he certainly knew of it and had read it. Because Sutton was also very young when he wrote that paper. He was a graduate student and then never went back to genetics again, right? I mean, he became a surgeon and then he unfortunately got appendicitis and died. But I just thought it would be worth bringing this up just because it just brings us back full circle almost to the beginning of the series. Do Soraya or Georgina have anything to add? You know, I mean, I must say when Matthew just read out the quote, 
there are parallels, but not striking parallels, right? I mean, what is really striking is this beginning, no? It has not escaped our notice. That's also how most often it is cited, right? What follows is forgotten, right? It has not escaped our notice. That's a very sort of interesting phrase. And I mean, if Saturn would have used that phrase, then yes, right? <laughs> but he did not. And I think probably we could find more papers, you know, and only because it's about the pairing and so on. There are, there are sort of, you know, intellectual parallels. But I mean, I haven't done the exercise, but I could imagine that if we look at other papers, we find similar endings. Or what do you think? <laughs> so opening up, you know, saying what I will do in the next paper or something, right? I don't know. So, but it didn't struck me as sort of exact, you know, it's a longer paragraph. It's not just a sentence. It's, it doesn't include exactly the same sentences, which they, if they wanted to make the reference, I think they would have made it more similar. That's what I would say, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's striking, but it's perhaps simply you've come to the end of the article. You've got to say something that it's much more condensed in the Watson Crick version, partly because that was Crick style and it is, is clearly a very Crickian phrase, but also they're under the pressure of space, which Sutton wasn't. And they've got to cram it all in into as little space as possible. And they're trying to be as condensed, but it's there from the first draft. It's there at, at the end. What changes in the first draft is the opening Georgina's stuff about Pauling, that gets refined and gradually honed as they exchange the articles between them. That final sentence is, is sitting there from the very beginning as a marker, as Crick said, because they didn't then do the experiments, but they wanted to say, look, we, we realize this because otherwise it would look kind of daft if they just had a structure and didn't say the most immediately obvious thing about it. And isn't it also that Watson didn't want that sentence in? And it was Crick who insisted? No, I don't think so. I think Jim was happy about it. I don't recall anything from him about that sentence. I thought it was Crick who wanted this sentence and then also the next paper on the genetical implication and that Watson was much more cagey about this. He didn't want to discuss all of that speculative stuff, but this sentence, I think, was the compromise that Watson was pretty peaceful with. It strikes me as a piece of very English false self-deprecation. That use of the negative is a very, very English thing to do. And I don't mean English language, I mean English English. And it sounds self-deprecating, but when you actually think about it, it's completely the opposite. You just summed up Crick there. <laughs> okay, well, we're running out of time. So I'd like to thank you all very, very much for coming in and giving us such an interesting discussion today. I'm really grateful. This has been a recording at the Consortium for the History of Science, Technology and Medicine. Today is December 11th. And please tune back in for one last main episode next month. Thank you.